A few months ago, I saw that Nikon was going to release a 17 to 28 millimeter f2.8 Z mount lens. I immediately became interested in how this lens would perform for astrophotography and nightscapes, and if it had a place in my bag or someone else's gear bag. Hello everyone, I'm Will Cheney. A few weeks ago, Nikon sent me a 17 to 28 millimeter f2.8 Z mount lens so that I could test it out for astrophotography and nightscapes. In this video, I'll talk about the key specs with this lens that make it great for astrophotography, the pros and cons of it, a few of the test images that I took with the lens out in the field, then we'll talk about the deal breakers that I have with it, and then finally we'll take a look at a couple of the alternatives that Nikon makes. If you're looking for a wide angle astrophotography Z mount lens, then you'll want to stick around to see if this lens has a place in your bag. At this point, let's roll into talking about some of the key specs. So the first thing to note is that the price on this lens is $1,199, so roughly a $1,200 lens. It is a full frame format wide angle zoom lens that goes from 17 to 28 millimeters and has a maximum aperture of f2.8. When shooting at 17 millimeters and with an aperture of f2.8, you can get a minimum focal distance of seven and a half inches. Looking at the dimensions and the size of this lens, it weighs in at 0.99 pounds, so we'll just call it one pound and it has a three inch diameter and it is four inches long along with those dimensions on the front side of it it has a 67 millimeter filter thread so next let's take a look at the pros of this lens so when you're looking at astrophotography what you really want is that wide angle if you're trying to avoid using a star tracker that way you can get those longer exposure times on the stars so with this lens, you get a minimum focal length of 17 millimeters, which is great for astrophotography because then you're looking at about a 13 second exposure without the stars trailing in your image. Um, now, if you start going to the 28 side, we'll get into that a little bit on the cons. The next thing that's great about this lens is it has a maximum aperture of f2.8. So that means you're gonna be able to bring in a lot of light into your images. And then the next thing that I really like about it with uh, respect to the pros is just its size. So it's actually actually a fairly small lens. It's roughly comparable in size to the 24 to 70 millimeter kit lens that comes with the Nikon Z series cameras. You know, and then it's also got a really big uh, ring here to use for changing your focal length. I mean, I find that I liked that just from it's so it's about an inch, maybe a little bit longer than that. Um, but it's really easy to tell the difference between which one you're trying to spin, whether you're looking at your focus ring that's right here or your focal length adjustment ring. And then the final pro that I have on this lens is really the price. Um, it falls kind of in a mid range uh, between some of the lenses that are down around the $500 value that are made by other um, companies like Rokinon. Um, but then you're on the higher end, you've got the Nikon 14 to 24 millimeter, which is a fantastic lens, but it falls in at a price tag upwards of $2,000. So coming in at uh, $1,200 is a really nice medium point in my mind, um, especially when it's almost um, the same focal lengths as the 14 to 24. And through the testing, I really found that there wasn't any difference in the quality of the lens. So moving over to the cons, um, probably the biggest con that I had is right in this area. If you'll notice, there's no automatic or manual focus switch. So you can switch into manual focus just by spinning the dial here. Um, but the other option that you have to go to if you really want to go into a true manual focus mode where there's no chance of the autofocus coming back into play is you have to go into the settings on the camera and actually turn that off. And for nightscapes and astrophotography, I just, I never want any chance that the autofocus is going to take over and try to focus while I'm trying to shoot the stars. The next con is just more of a gripe on my end. Um, I think f2.8 is more than enough for astrophotography, but there are lenses out there that go larger than that. So talking about f1.8 or f1.2. Um, so you do get a little bit of limitation there, especially if you're shooting on that, the 28 millimeter end, um, you're gonna have to start using a star tracker when you get into those um, longer focal lengths that this lens can go to. Um, but overall, still great. As with any of the uh, Nikon Z series lenses that I've used so far for astrophotography, still the hardest part, um, and it translates into this lens, Lens is just getting the focus on the stars. Um, I kind of talked about the switch with the autofocus and the manual focus, um, but still the best way that I seem to find is just turning 
the camera off and back on as long as you don't have the save last focus point setting turned on in the camera. Um, I did play around a little bit with there's some adjustments you can make to how much the focus will actually adjust based on uh, the distance that you turn this ring here. But I still find that that uh, digital focusing system versus the mechanical one does seem to be a little jittery and a little jumpy with these lenses. So just be aware of that, but you can get around it. The next con that I'll talk about, um, this one's kind of funny to me because when I was reviewing the 14 to 24 millimeter, that lens has a screen that's actually on it. Whereas you turn the dial, you can actually see it read out uh, what focal length you're at. And to me, I just kind of thought that was crazy at the time. Looking back, I really like having it now. I mean, it's something that I wish this lens had on it, but then again, at $1,200 for this lens, um, I'm not surprised that it's not there. It would make it a little bit easier at times in the middle of the night to be able to see what focal length that I've set the lens to. And then the final con, which we'll walk through more of when we go through the test images, is just that out in the corners, um, I did have some issues with the stars not being quite as sharp. Again, we'll take a little bit more in-depth look at that when we get into the test photos that I took. So up next, like I talked about, we'll go through a few of those test images that I've taken with the lens with respect to astrophotography and nightscapes. And be sure after that to stick around for my deal breakers and a few alternative lenses that Nikon makes for the Z mount cameras. So stay tuned for that. But first, if you would, I'd really appreciate it if you liked this video and also subscribe to my channel. And if you're interested in giving this lens a try, be sure to check out my affiliate links below to lensrentals.com where you can go and actually rent this lens and give it a try before you decide to drop $1,200 on purchasing it. So from here, let's switch gears and go into the photo reviews. All right, so let's take a look here at the first photo. This is one of the ones that I took um, using F3.5. It's a 13 second exposure. And what we're gonna look at here is across three different exposures. Um, I lowered or raised the aperture across each one. So I went from F3.5 to F3.2 and then up to F2.8. And what we're gonna look at here is just how as that aperture increases that the vignette out in the corners is gonna also increase, so it's gonna get darker. All right, so taking a look at the F3.5 and the F2.8 side by side, uh, it's a little easier to see than me trying to fumble through each of the three photos real quickly and Lightroom tries to load them in. Um, you can definitely tell up here, uh, it is darker on the F2.8. Um, it's not a whole lot, to be honest, when you go through and edit this photo, you're not gonna see that a whole bunch. Um, it is there, but uh, really not that bad for being at F2.8. And if you wanna minimize that a little bit, all you gotta do is go to F3.2. You're not gonna bring in as much light, but you're gonna lower your vignetting. All right, so let's jump back over to the single screen view. Um, that's kind of the main thing to look at um, with the vignetting for F2.8. Uh, you know, this is going into 200%. Really not much going on up here with coma. You can see a little bit of uh, light that looks like it's kind of bleeding out of the stars. Uh, we'll go ahead and look at the F3.5. And it's really not any different. So what you might see on a lens that isn't performing as well is as you get into those higher apertures, you'll see more coma apparent and it'll start looking like, I know some people call it angel wings or UFOs out in the corner, um, that type of stuff. And you just don't see that on this lens. So let's jump to the next image. This one is taken from that same set. Um, this is just with a little bit of post-processing going to it. So I've done a little bit of corrections for the color. Still not sure 100% what I'm gonna do with this edit. Um, I may do some more work to it, but that's where I'm at with it today. Another aspect of um, astrophotography, and this one really is something that I've been wanting to take a photo of for a while. And when I was out standing in this wind farm, um, I just happen to be in a spot where Abilene, which is a bigger city and has quite a bit of light pollution, was sitting off over in this area. Um, so it was a little bit off to my northeast farther, and I was actually able to see the zodiacal light for the first time. Um, and so I went ahead and decided to go ahead and take a photo of it. Um, definitely something that I wanted to do more of in the future, but I thought it would make a cool photo for uh, this review. Um, but again, uh, not too bad out here in the corners um, in terms of having coma. Um, 
you definitely, because I've done some a little bit heavier editing on this one to get the zodiacal light to stand out a little bit more. The vignetting is a little bit more apparent out here in these corners because I bumped up the contrast to try to get the white light from the zodiacal light to stand out more. Uh, but still, great looking picture here from that lens. So the other thing that I did do um, just from my house, which is in a more light polluted area, um, I did just take some test images um, trying, you know, I've talked about the trick with turning the camera off and then back on to just use the cameras focusing to get to infinity versus um, going in and actually trying to manual focus with these digital focus systems. Uh, so looking out here at the stars, um, it does look like it, this particular image was a little bit off um, in terms of being in focus because as I go to the next photo, um, this was one that first one was during, turning the camera off and then back on. This one was a manual focus. You can tell I got it just slightly better um, in terms of being in focus. Um, and then this, just another example there of uh, the importance of getting your camera in focus. So looking out here at the edges, again, not much going on in terms of coma. Um, let me switch back to this one. Um, and then even moving in towards the center, um, it looks pretty good. Uh, one thing, you know, I was interested in this is a planet that was out there, so it's super bright. Um, so that's already going to be harder for the lens to handle. And I can tell you that I did some test shots with the uh, 14 to 24 millimeter, and you can go see those in my comparison video to that lens. Uh, but this planet looked exactly the same in the 14 to 24. So. Uh, no difference there in the quality of those two lenses. The next thing that we'll look at, um, this was taken on a star tracker. So uh, what I did was I set up at, uh, I believe it was 17 millimeters and ran it for about an hour and a half and stacked all of those images together. Uh, I'm still working on this edit. I would say it's a long ways from where I probably want to get it to. Just kind of gives you an idea of the capabilities that these lenses paired with a Nikon Z series camera are capable of. Um, I mean, you can see uh, this entire Barnard's loop. Um, you've got the Orion Nebula in here. Um, there's the Flame Nebula. There's lots of gases that are being picked up uh, throughout the Milky Way. And there's even this other really faint uh, either gas or dust clouds, whatever they are, that are um, out here in space. Um, and those can all be picked up by uh, this lens combined with a Z-series camera. Uh, if you can get enough exposure time and be in a, uh, dark enough skies. So this is the result of stacking and doing quite a bit of processing. But this image here is actually one of the raw images taken that produced that image. So, um, you know, just zooming in, you can see Orion's a little blown out. Um, you can actually see the flame nebula here. Um, so pretty cool. Um, I think this was Mars that made that nice ugly yellow spot in the last picture that I got to figure out what I'm going to fix with it. Uh, but pretty cool that you can do this with this lens. And then finally, another aspect of astrophotography, um, doing star trails. So um, here's just an example of a star trail photo that I took using the 17 to 28 millimeter with a Nikon Z7 II. Um, again, still a little bit of editing that I want to do on this photo, but um, overall, I think that just gives you a good idea of uh, what your star trails can end up looking like. All right, next, let's take a look at the deal breakers for this lens. So for me, two deal breakers on this whenever I'm looking at a wide angle astrophotography lens to put in my bag. And the first one is that it only goes to 17 millimeters. Um, I really like having the 14 millimeters to get those really wide expansive shots of the Milky Way. Um, so for me, the 17 millimeters just isn't quite enough. Um, you know, if money not involved, I would rather have 14 millimeters than just be cut off at 17. However, on the other end, you kind of get into a different aspect that's a deal breaker 
for me and that's that it goes up to 28 millimeters. So the 24 millimeters on the 14 to 24 millimeter lens, I can still get about an eight second exposure on the 24 millimeters before the stars start to trail. But if you really want to utilize the full focal length on the 17 to 28 millimeter lens, you're going to have to start using a star tracker. So you're going to have to have another tool in your bag when you go out to shoot astrophotography. And the big thing I think I'll note on here is really those two deal breakers aren't that big of an issue. So really when I'm looking at deal breakers on an astrophotography and nightscape lens, I'm really looking at the quality of the lens and looking at, you know, how do the stars look out in the corners? Is there trailing? Um, any aberrations, coma, that sort of stuff. And for me, this lens just doesn't have that. So um, great lens with that regards, just so minor deal breaker there on the focal lengths. The next thing to talk about is the alternative lenses. So the first one, I've already mentioned it a few times in this video, is the 14 to 24 millimeter f2.8 lens. Again, really fantastic lens. It's a lot bulkier than the 17 to 28 millimeter. Um, and it's also a lot pricier, but it does come with additional features like the display that I mentioned. Um, and it's just overall a fantastic lens. Uh, one thing I do think that the 17 to 28 millimeter holds over it other than the price and the bulkiness is I like that the filter thread on the 17 to 28 is a 67 millimeter filter thread and not the, the giant one that's on the 14 to 24. The next lens that I would take a look at as an alternative would be the 20 millimeter f1.8. Looking at comparing that to the 17 to 28, um, obviously you're at a prime lens there, so you're not going to be able to adjust the focal length. However, you do get um, about a stop higher on your aperture, so you're going to 1.8 now. Um, so you're going to be able to double the amount of light that you can get in from the f2.8. And that's gonna help you bring out even more detail in your uh, nightscapes and astrophotography shots. And at a price point similar to the 17 to 28 millimeter, it is roughly comparable there in price. The only difference is do you want that ability to change your focal length or are you good with just having that prime fixed focal length? And then last but not least, uh, the 14 to 30 millimeter is one that I used to would consider putting in the astrophotography category. However, now I think with the 17 to 28 millimeter, um, I just don't think it really has a place there for astrophotography and nightscapes unless you're going to put it on a tracker. And the reason being that the 14 to 30 millimeter only goes to a maximum aperture of f4. So that's really starting to limit you. And I think now with Nikon coming out with this wider glass, there's just not a reason I think that I would go by the 14 to 30 in any regards over the 17 to 28 millimeter. So wrapping this video up, um, this lens really has been fantastic for astrophotography and nightscapes. Like I mentioned, I do wish it went wider than 17 millimeters. However, I think for the price point and the abilities that this lens has, it's really a fantastic lens. Unfortunately, at this point, I think you know if you've watched this channel that I've got a 14 to 24 millimeter. So for myself personally, you know, maybe if this lens had come out uh, two years ago with the um, 14 to 24 millimeter probably would have had a pretty tough decision to make there. I am still happy with the fact that I have the 14 to 24 millimeter. So at this point, I'm just not going to be buying this lens. But if I were doing other things like videography, which this lens is really targeted for that market, then I probably would be looking at it because the weight and the size difference is so drastic compared to the 14 to 24, which then ends up helping you with setting up the camera on gimbals and other things that go into videography. But like I said, at the price, I think it's a really great contender for somebody that just can't afford the $2,300 14 to 24 millimeter lens. So let me know down in the comments if you have any questions regarding this lens or anything else you want to know about it. I'd really appreciate if you decided to purchase this lens or if you wanted to rent it. If you use my affiliate links down below, that helps me keep the channel going. And then please don't forget to like and subscribe while you're here. And as always, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.